Okay, we're on. I'm on. If you guys want to see what I look like, go to YouTube, to my channel. I'm on. Okay, folks. We're on. Yep. Dragon Lady, go on YouTube. I'm live. You can see what I look like. God has blessed me. By the grace of the Lord Jesus, I've lost a lot of weight, but I still need to lose more and pray I don't gain it, right? Hey, David, thanks for your inspiration, fellow psychos. Well, Andrew Owen. Hey, you're, yeah. Hey, Andrew. I was looking for you the other day, buddy, Andrew Owen. I'm glad you're here because I'm going to ask you a question. Andrew, can you confirm that you hear me? Yeah, but Dragon's Ladies, you saw me when I was 100 pounds overweight. Don't hate, Dragon Lady. Just be a supporter. Okay, Blue, good to see you, Blue. Okay. Guys, if you're wondering who I'm talking to, I'm live streaming the YouTube session for Child of God's Pal Talk group. So I have the mic locked on his computer, and on Pal Talk, they're listening. But I said, if the ladies want to see how handsome and beautiful I am, they have to come to my YouTube channel and see this big, bald, Assyrian hunk of humanity. Arr! Okay, guys, it's been good, good to see you guys. It's been a while. God bless every one of you, all of you. Thank you, all of you. Good. Tell Discord they better not be discorded. <laughs> yeah, that was that was lame. Hey, Andrew Owen, you there, bro? Andrew Owen, you there? Man, Ron, if you no, it was, it was a rough week this week. Werewolves of Assyria. I'm trying to get Andrew Owen's attention, but I think he's hiding in the background. Hello, Earth calling Andrew Owen. Okay, yeah. Last time you made a comment, you did what I call a hit and run. You said it sounds like Nestorianism. So I'm going to give you the benefit of doubt and assume that you are wondering whether it's Nestorianism and not trying to challenge me and pontificate. I had said that as God, Jesus has a father, no mother. As man, he has a mother, no father. And you said that it sounds like Nestorianism. First and foremost, let me ask you a question. So, Andrew, please answer and answer directly. In respect to his divine nature, as an eternal divine person, who has a divine nature, does Jesus have a mother? Thank you, Dragon Lady. See, you're there. I see you. I see you on YouTube. Does Jesus have a mother? All right. Now, Dragon Lady, you can find me on my YouTube channel because I try to live stream every day when I have time. All right. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for Andrew. Please don't delay because I want to get into the thick of things. Libertas. Okay. Now, since Jesus then took on a human nature and became a man, that one person became a man, took on a human nature, in respect to his humanity as a man, does he have a human father, a biological father? Yep, you can zero everyone else. You want to go live to uh, my YouTube stream? You can see my face. Okay, so then why would you say it sounds like Nestorianism? I'm really confused. I just said that one person, he's both God and man, that one person in respect to his divine nature has a father, in respect to his human nature has a mother, but he has no human father. Why would you then make that comment? Nestorianism teaches that there's a human Jesus and a divine Christ, two distinct persons and beings that came together. How in the world is that Nestorianism when we all agree Christ is one eternal divine person and as God, he has a father who then became human, took on a human nature, adding a second nature to his divine person. And in his human nature, he has a mother, but no father. Why would you then? Wait, wait. How is it arbitrary to divide his person when we are affirming the distinction of his natures? You do that all the time, Andrew Owen, and I'm going to catch you on your inconsistency. So when Jesus was nailed on the cross and died, did God die and was God buried? Let's see who's being arbitrary. Andrew, you're being arbitrary. Why are you dividing his person? You see what you just did? You did the very thing you accused me of, and I don't tolerate inconsistency and false accusation. Why did you now divide the person and saying, well, 
he didn't die as God. He died as a man. You just did the very thing you accused me of. Now, Andrew, how long do you think you're going to remain in my <clears throat> YouTube channel for being inconsistent? How long do you think you're going to last for being inconsistent and duplicitous, accusing me of something that you yourself are guilty of doing? Now, give me a reason why I should leave you on my channel in light of your inconsistency and <clears throat> your slander of me. Kaloyan, Avonov, you need to get out of here too. Leave now because I'm going to block you. Okay. So, Andrew, how long do you think you, you're you going to last? And why should I leave you here after your slander of me, of accusing me of sounding Nestorian? Kaloyan Ivanov, leave. I'm going to block you now. Okay, that's good, Andrew. God bless you, but let me tell you something. Okay, let me tell you something. No, it's, it is up to me, but I'm trying to be gracious because I don't want Jesus to be angry with me because I have a lot of sins that give him reason to be angry with me. Please do me a favor, Andrew. Don't think you know more than you do. Don't pontificate and accuse me or others due to your own ignorance. And I'm being very honest. I'm not trying to put you down. When you make a comment like that, that means you come off as if you know the subject at hand. And you're qualified to make a criticism, but in reality, you don't. You're like David Wood. David Wood runs his mouth, and he gets about 400,000 subscribers, yet he's boring as pits, doesn't know what he's talking about, and he plagiarizes all my material and the material of others like Anthony Rogers, and he took off stealing our material, and now he's money bucks. You're like David Wood, right? Don't be like David Wood, Andrew Owen. You're better than him. He's white dictator. He follows the typical stereotype of the white man. Kill whitey. Don't be like David Wood, Andrew Owen. Please, you're better than that. Yeah, but you're a better white man than that white dictator, David Wood. Ron M., you're worse than David Wood because you don't get the joke, Ron M., you know why you're worse than David Wood? David Wood is here in my channel, right? Trolling. Act 17. That's him. He's trolling. He's attacking me. So you're worse than David Wood, Ron M. All right. Sorry, guys. For those of you on Peltalk, sometimes I have to get into some serious interaction with some of my YouTubers. So if you want to see what I look like, for especially if you're single, you want to mingle. No, I'm kidding. I'm playing with you guys. All right. With that said... Riaz Qureshi, you are a hater, dude. If you think David Wood is amazing, then what would you think about me and Anthony Rogers? If he amazes you, boy, you're desperate. Anyway, Hater Wood's in the house. He started Haterade. All right. Yes, Christian, a child of God is with me, but he's busy. I'm using his internet. Pray for a child of God. Thank the Lord for his graciousness for allowing me to be here. And use his internet. All right. Yeah, well, I, I'll talk about that in due time. Lord Jesus willing, I'll talk about that in due time. Andrew Owen about the Nestorian controversy because it was a lot of misinformation, falsely accusing Nestorians of believing something they did not believe. And I'll give you documentation for that in a minute. But let's begin because, folks, I'm hoping the Spirit will fill me, have mercy on me, and forgive me. It was a rough weekend for me. It was rough starting from Thanksgiving. Yes, I will, David. That's what I'm about to do. I just want to let you know. I just want to let you know that this weekend was very rough. Thanksgiving was rough because, again, although I was surrounded by a lot of loving family members and friends, and we had a great time talking about Jesus Christ and glorifying Jesus Christ and God used me to preach, I still struggled with loneliness and also and I say this by way of confession, asking for prayers, that I do struggle with fleshly desires. Ask Jesus Christ in his mercy to give me the power of the Spirit to die to my flesh, to crucify it, and to not indulge it, but to despise it and walk in the power of the Spirit, and that the Lord Jesus will forgive me and have mercy on me and be patient with me. 
Folks, it really stinks. For lack of a better word, it sucks being in this flesh body. It sucks struggling with fleshly desires, whether it's anger, impatience, fears, doubts, lust, you name it. It, lack of a better term, it sucks and it depresses me. It's like a vicious cycle. I get lonely and my flesh kicks in. And if I indulge my flesh, I get even more lonelier and sad, right? So pray that the Holy Spirit will have mercy on all of us. Pray the Holy Spirit will have mercy on me and not be angry with me in Jesus' name. Well, theosis, John Chesterton, is the goal of every Christian where the Holy Spirit transforms us to become more like Jesus in purity, holiness, and love. And we have a responsibility to yield to the Spirit and walk in the life of the Spirit. But I'm so accustomed to walking in the flesh because don't forget, folks, up until the point the Spirit made you alive, all we did was walk in the flesh, indulge the flesh. So it is natural for us to go back to the flesh. It is supernatural to resist the flesh and walk in the spirit. Right? Right? Because, remember, flesh gives birth to flesh, our Lord Jesus taught. Flesh gives birth to flesh. And the spirit gives birth to the spirit. So we were born of flesh. We lived in the flesh, we walked in the flesh, we indulged the flesh, and now the Spirit came and gave us spiritual birth and is transforming us to resist the flesh and no longer walk in the flesh, even though that's second nature to us. The Holy Spirit wants to make walking in the Spirit second nature to us, and it's work, it's discipline. That's why Paul uses the metaphor of discipline, of boxing, right, of, of racing, he uses the metaphor of exercise, to exercise your spiritual muscles, to walk in the life of the spirit so that you can overcome the flesh by your spiritual muscles. So it's discipline, discipline, right? So, but keep praying. Ask the Lord Jesus to help me because it was a bad weekend for me. And pray for favor tomorrow without going into details. My journey in this state begins. God gave me favor locally, but I still am accountable. And I have to <clears throat> meet with my accountability, quote unquote, partner. Pray for favor that God will put love in the heart of that person to love me for the sake of Jesus and work with me and keep me here. So I need prayers for tomorrow for miraculous favor. Can you guys pray for me? In Jesus' name. Not said, let's ask the Lord to show up. In spite of my failures, we love you, Father. <clears throat> we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Please, Father, help us, Lord. Help us. We're all tired, Father. I am tired, Lord. I'm tired of succumbing to the flesh. I'm tired of struggling with the flesh. Because I know that when we indulge the flesh, we grieve your heart, the heart of Jesus, and grieve your spirit. Help us, Father. Abba, help us. Babi, help us. Avinu, because of Jesus, we can call out to you, Abba. You are our Father, my Father, because of Jesus. Please, Father, help us. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit to just despise the flesh completely and walk in the freedom that comes from your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Seal us by your spirit transform us by your spirit to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ in resisting, more like the Lord Jesus Christ in loving each other and being patient with each other, more like the Lord Jesus Christ in worshiping you the way Jesus did on earth as the perfect man. And give us the grace to die to our flesh, to die to the world, and to resist the evil one as the blood of Jesus shields us and cleanses us and purifies us, and the Holy Spirit just sanctifies us. I pray the blood of Jesus will also cover our loved ones, that the blood of Jesus will wash my daughters and purify them and seal them. Please, Abba. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. Have your way in this session. Give me the power of your Holy Spirit to recall scriptures and interpret them perfectly and clearly and correctly. Save me from confusion and stammering and from misinterpretation, Father. And save me from being a crowd pleaser. Please, Father, sanctify my motives to speak the truth in love. Not harshly 
and save me from being unnecessarily offensive and bless your people who are listening. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, with your love, with your wisdom, with your knowledge, with life from your spirit, with fruit from your spirit, with passion from your spirit and cover us by the blood of Jesus. And Father, give me the health I need to do this work until it's time for me to leave and enter the presence of Jesus. And please be patient with us, Abba. Please, and help me to be patient with my brothers and sisters. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. And Holy Spirit, we love you. Teach me your ways and help me to bless your people, Holy Spirit. Teach me to teach them and make the sound of my voice pleasing to their ears. And beatify me, beatify us with the beauty of Jesus. We need you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. All right. You guys ready? Now, you see that I have been titling these sessions after prominent Muslim dawagandists, right? Why? Because I'm being a little deceitful here. God have mercy on me. I'm trying to draw in Muslims to start listening to the shows. But Lord willing... I'm going to try to keep my topics focused primarily on core Christian doctrines, trusting the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and knowledge, understanding, and to the depth of the scriptures, to plumb the depths of the, the depth of the scriptures as he loosens my tongue. Please, Holy Spirit, guide the conversation for the glory of Jesus so we can see how amazingly deep the word of God is. Stand in greater awe of the author of this book, who is the triune God, and fall more passionate in love with God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? But I will be addressing <clears throat> here and there objections by Muslims, by Jehovah's Witnesses, by Unitarians, because as we respond to the toughest objections, it will help accomplish at least two things. Not only will we be able to respond to the objections and refute them, but these objections give us the opportunity to go deeper into the Word of God, to go deeper into the Scriptures, trusting by the Holy Spirit to give us further illumination to understand the core doctrines of the Bible much more deeply, more profoundly. Right? Everyone with me there? Pray that we can get more viewers and subscribers. In fact, some of our greatest statements and theologies and creeds were the direct result of attacks on the Christian faith, right? Some of the greatest statements of faith, uh, creeds, confessions, were the result of heretics attacking the truth, forcing the true believers to prayerfully seek the face of God, plumbing deeper into the word, the word by the grace of the Holy Spirit and understanding what the Bible taught more clearly and articulating it more profoundly and more clearly, right? Everyone with me there? And in the wisdom of God, God has permitted, let me repeat this, let me repeat this, and I pray that I will speak clearly and coherently for the glory of Christ. In the wisdom of God, God has allowed, has permitted heresies, divisions in the church for the specific purpose of using heretics or weaker brothers and sisters to sharpen believers by the grace of God's spirit to become stronger spiritually, mentally, emotionally, as well as physically. Now, let me give you the Bible verse to prove it. First Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to 19. Those of you on Pal Talk, make sure to subscribe to uh, subscribe. Holy Spirit, take over my mouth for the glory of Jesus and sanctify us and give us the power to live holy for the glory of Christ. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the like button. Now, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 19. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you when you come together in the church, pay attention to this. When you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. I've been told that you're a divided church. I've been told you're a divided church, and I do believe it in part. Now notice what Paul says, and we believe Paul is writing this as the Holy Spirit is instructing him to write these words. For there must be also heresies among you. Notice. 
It's not an option. There have to be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Did you catch the wisdom of God in allowing this necessary evil? Did you catch it? Did you catch it there? You see what Paul says? There must be heresies among you. This is a necessary evil that God tolerates, though he hates. And if you're not aware, the Bible is quite clear. God has tolerated a lot of things that he hates from his heart. And he tolerated it for a reason and for a season. Did you know that? So here, notice what Paul says. Heresies must exist because through these heresies, God will make manifest those who have his approval. What does he mean? Heresies will be used by the Spirit to draw, drive the true servants of God, the true children of God, to plumb the word more deeply, to understand the, the word more correctly, and then to proclaim the word more accurately and then live it out more passionately. Clear? Is it making sense? I'm not trying to speak loud, but for some reason I get loud. Sometimes I'm monotone. I don't know. As the Holy Spirit takes over. As long as he takes over, we'll be blessed. Exactly, medic for Christ. As long as you're grounded in the truth, there's nothing wrong. In fact, here, by way of testimony, to confirm medic for Christ. When I came into the faith and started doing apologetics, most of the material that I read, was produced by Muslims and anti-Trinitarians attacking the Christian faith. I did read Christian authors and responses to the Muslims, but most of my time was spent reading or viewing the attacks by Muslims, as well as Jehovah's Witnesses, on the Christian faith, because those attacks forced me to sit back and think how to respond to their objections, or to see how they were responding to our responses. Right? You with me there? Is that clear before I move on to the next point? I'll give you an example of what I mean. Learning how the other side, the Muslims and anti-Trinitarians, were responding to our proof texts. I'll give you an example of what I mean. If I were to ask you guys, quote a verse from the Gospels. Quote a verse from the Gospels where Jesus claims to be God. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Type it. Rise the Lionheart. Heretics are those who choose to believe something contrary to the truth of the Bible. Heretics are people who think they have the truth, but pervert the Bible, making the Bible teach something that it doesn't. Like Joe's witnesses are heretics. Okay, Bill Thompson said, before Abraham was, I am. Androne said, the Lord said to my Lord. That's Psalm 110.1. Okay. Now, let me tell you the answer to John 8.58. Are you ready? This is what I was waiting for. Are you ready? And Matthew 26, 63, the Son of Man. Okay. Because most Christians, listen to me, most Christians will only listen to their own, their camp, and giving them the evidence, let's say for the Trinity, deity of Christ, they are not prepared for the responses to their proof text. For example, Rias and Academia Apologia quoted the same text, basically. Mark 14, 62 and Matthew 26, 63 is about Jesus' response to the high priest where he says that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven, right? And walking in the light. I'm glad you mentioned I and the Father are one. I'm going to use this as a teaching moment. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill us and guide me to bless you. Okay. Now, why do you assume that Jesus' statement to the high priest somehow affirms his deity? Beautiful. 
just in someone. Oh, I got water. Tell them later. We'll talk about Quran. You with me there? You with me there? Why does that show that Jesus is claiming to be God? When he says, I am the Messiah, the Son of God, as you have said, and you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. I'm not asking about John 8, 58, Andrew Owen, and you'd be surprised. Okay, Daniel, okay, so you guys quoted the passage, but you're not able to explain it to me. Explain it to me. How does that show that Jesus claimed to be God? Explain it, guys. Ahmed Didat, I'm going to play the role of Ahmed Didat. I just put you on the spot. Explain it, because I'm going to use this as a teaching moment. Why we need to hear the responses to our evidences and be prepared to refute them. Now, Armando Santos said, only God comes on clouds in the Old Testament. Okay, here's the problem with your assertion, Armando. Is it not true that in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, the Son of Man approaches another divine being called the Ancient of Days, and that Ancient of Days gives to the Son of Man his dominion, his power, his glory. Right? Everyone, are you listening? Because this is now the response. Here's the answer to your statement. Well, you just proved that the Son of Man is an inferior, subordinate deity because another gives him his power, his glory, his dominion. If the Son of Man is God, how can God be given what he already possesses? Do you see the objection? That's the objection by Joe's Witnesses and other anti-Trinitarian Unitarians. Armando, eternal generation has nothing to do with Daniel 7, 13 or 14. It's not talking about the Son of Man's deity. It's talking about the Son of Man being given a kingdom that's indestructible and being given power and dominion as he approaches him. It's not talking about his deity why he is divine, this is talking about the Son of Man at a specific moment of time coming to the Ancient of Days. Okay, see? Medic just confirmed this was used against him, and Riaz remembered Sami Zatri using this objection. Okay? So you see what happened to you Christians? You guys got discombobulated. You know why you guys got discombobulated? Because you simply listen to those from your own camp and you parrot what you hear, but you don't take a moment to go listen to the other side to see how an anti-Trinitarian would respond to your proof text and therefore are unprepared for their objection. You with me there? Okay. Now, let's go back to the other one. Before Abraham was born, I am. Okay? Before Abraham was born, I am. Okay. Okay. Lord willing, I'll answer these objections, but what I'm trying to show you here is why heresies exist. God has permitted this necessary evil to force Christians out of their complacency and laziness so they prayerfully seek the face of the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand the meaning of these passages with greater clarity and depth. Okay? Hmm. Jesus is our Passover lamb. You're begging the question. Since the Old Testament is quite clear, Jehovah is God. For someone to give Jehovah something would undermine his deity, but you still have yet to prove that Jesus is that Jehovah, especially when there's another person called the Father, who happens to be Jehovah. Okay, now, let's go to John 8, 58, the one that you mentioned. Before Abraham was born, I am. Well, keep praying for me, Lion Bar, because I don't feel too healthy this week. If the Lord wants to take me home, I pray I'm covered by the blood of Jesus and that he takes care of my daughters. If he wants me to be around a little longer, then may he give me the health I need and the holiness to delight his heart. No, 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 D Dr. Travis, that's an act actually a pathetic one. There's a better one. Are you ready for what I consider the strongest objection 
against our use of Jesus' statement that before Abraham was born, I am. The best objection that I've heard. That if you're not someone who's familiar with the debate, they'll catch you off guard. Okay, now, we quote John 8, 58 saying, you see, Jesus Christ said, before Abraham was born, I am. And he's using the name of God in Exodus 3, 14, right? Exodus 3, 14. Vine, are you still with me? Did I put you to sleep? No, it's not in reference to Isaiah 53, 10. And it's not Exodus 4, it's Exodus 3, 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. Okay. Now let's see Exodus 3, verse 14. Okay. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Okay. See, Jesus says, Before Abraham was born, I am. And God said to Moses, His name is I am. End of story. Jesus claimed to be God, right? Right? End of story. Jesus said, I am. God said, I am. So Jesus is the I am that spoke to Moses. Therefore, he's Jehovah. End of story, correct? That's not what we're talking about, Ron M. I know you're going to John 9 9. I know that's an objection you probably heard. I'm not talking about the, the blind man saying, I am. We're talking about Exodus 3 14, how it does not tie in necessarily with Jesus's I am statements. Okay, everyone with me? Okay, here's the problem, folks. This is why if you're reading a translation other than the King James Bible, like NIV or New American Standard Bible or English Standard Version, ESV, they will give you notes. They will give you notes telling you that the word I am is the Hebrew eh yeah. Eh yeah. And that's why in your note, don't take my word for it. Go to blueletterbible.org. Put in Exodus 3.14. Check out the NIV with their footnotes. Right? With their footnotes. Okay? They'll tell you that the phrase in Hebrew, Ehyeh, Ashir, Ehyeh, Ehyeh, can also mean I will be what I will be. I will be. So the verb in Hebrew, ehyeh, is actually a future tense verb. Future tense verb. It literally means I will be. Did you know that? Now, don't take my word for it. Look up your Bible translation, NIV, ESV. Look at the note provided. For Exodus 3.14, it, it will tell you that it can also be rendered as, I will be what I will be. Can you guys do it for me? Take a moment to see before I move on. Because I'm going to have to get it for you if you don't believe me. Here. Let's see if I can do it. Do it. Blueletterbible.org. See? Joel, you confirmed, right? Okay. You confirm? I want all of you to do this. I may not be entertaining, but I pray to be educational by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can grow. Okay. Now here, let me show you. Let me get it. Hold on. New International Version. Let me do this. Okay, here you go. Here's the link. Here's the link. Sorry, guys. Thank you, one shot. I am who I am. Thank you, one shot. I am what I am, or I will be what I will be, or even I create whatever I create. Thank you. Life is good. Thank you. I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. Thank you, guys. Here's the NIV. I just gave you the link. Here it is, the footnote. Notice what it says. Check it out. I will be what I will be. You see the problem? You guys, Christians, 
you are lazy. And I say this in love. Why in the world are you not reading your footnotes? Why, why are you so lazy? And why are you only listening to those from your camp, but not listening to the objections to your arguments to be prepared for those objections and refute them? How long will you go on only listening to your crowd, to your side, and rah, 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 but never allowing yourself to be challenged by unbelievers to force you to get out of your laziness and complacency and go deeper into the word. Their objection is the Hebrew of Exodus 3.14 isn't I am. It's I will be. Because the verb ahyeh is future tense. It's literally a causative verb. Meaning it's a verb that refers to, let's say, causation. I will do this. I will be this, right? So it's literally, I will be. It's not I am. So if I go to the Hebrew, God doesn't say I am. So what's the connection with Jesus in John 8, 58? And your own Trinitarian scholars are admitting that the Hebrew verb, Eheh, can also mean I will be. They're admitting it. And they're Trinitarian, and they love Jesus and believe he's God in the flesh. You got it? Now let me give you the link to the interlinear. So you guys see, follow me. Are you guys learning? Because this is going to be slow and methodical, not as entertaining, but you will be more educated. Yeah, and I'll get into the Greek in a minute, David Julius, because even the Greek backfires of Exodus 3.14. The Greek of Exodus 3.14 does not simply say ego aimi, David Julius. It says ego aimi haon. Haon. Not ego aimi. Haon. Right? Hello? 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 I don't know what it is. Okay. Now. Go to the link, interlinear. Go there. Is it okay? Someone said hello. You'll see in the interlinear, interlinear, the verb, look at the bottom. Even though it translates as I am, it says verb, cal stem, imperfect. It's in the imperfect tense. It's not present tense. You see it? You guys see it? It's okay. Forget about the Robocaller. Robocop. Send balls on his merry way. I don't know why he's here. He's wasting our time. Okay. If you see it now, I'm going to show you where the verb is used in verse 12. Verse 12. And I'll explain the meaning in a minute. Here it is, interlinear, biblehub.com, biblehub.com, it's interlinear. Go to verse 12, click here, Exodus 3, 12. Do you see the verb is used there too? So he said, Wayomer, ki ehye, imak. Do you see it says, so he said, surely I will be with you. And the word I will be is ehye. Do you see it? No, in perfect tense means that it's something in the past, past action, right, that can have effects for the present. But anyway, go there. Check it out. Do you see the verb ehye? Let me double check. Yep, imperfect. It's right there. Verb, cal. Form imperfect. Yep, it's right there. Okay. Okay, do you see it says I will be? I will be. Okay. Do you see it's the same verb? Why is it in Exodus 3:12? It's translated, I will be with you, not I am with you. But in verse 14, when that same verb is used, it's rendered I am, not I will be. It's the same verb. Ehyeh. 
So why in verse 12, in your translations, like in the King James, Exodus 3, 12, the verb ahia is rendered, I will be with you. I will be, not I am with you, right? But in 14, when that same verb ahia is used, it's I am what I am. I am has sent me. Let's see Exodus 3, 12 in the King James. Oh, is this sorry? Exodus three twelve in the King James. And he said, certainly, I will be with thee. Do you see it? Sixteen eleven. Everyone else, you see it? The verb here is I will be. It's the same verb in fourteen. I will be with thee. So let me ask you a question, folks. Here's where I'm going to challenge you to think more deeply, more critically, more biblically. In light of verse twelve. When God says to Moses, when Israel asks for my name, say, Ehyeh has sent me. It's Ehyeh, Ashir, Ehyeh. I will be what I will be. Tell them, Ehyeh has sent me. In line of verse 12, where God says to Moses, I will be with you when you go to Pharaoh. I will be. A promise that he'll be there in the future. Does it make more sense to render? Verse 14, where the same verb is used as I will be in light of verse 12, or I am. Because he's already used the verb in 12. And in 12, he's making a promise he'll be there in the future. Chicken rice is not listening. He's already making a promise to Moses. When in the future you face Pharaoh, I will be there. So in light of 12... Does it make more sense to interpret Ahia in 14 as I am or I will be? No, Ahia is used of others too, Jesus of the Passover lamb. Do me a favor, stop pontificating because Ahia is simply a verb used in context other than Jehovah. That's not true what you said. I guess you guys ain't listening. Let's try it again. Airframe says I am. In light of verse 12, this is the third time now. It gets tiring when I have to repeat myself. Okay, let's try it again. In light of verse 12, where God uses the verb ahiyat to mean I will be with you in the future. Does it make sense to then render the same verb in 14 as I am or as I will be? Three times I repeat it. In asking the question, I'm giving the answer. Okay. See, medic for Christ is really hurting me. I don't I don't get it. Okay, now, medic, you're going to have to defend your, your position because I'm going to block you if you can. Why would you say I am when the verb is used in 12 to refer, refer to God's promise of being there in the future? You don't defend your position, medic. You're getting blocked. I'm sorry. I love you, but I'm going to block you. Air Church, you're going to have to stop pontificating and give me the impression you know what you're talking about because it's the context that will define the extent of the verb. Not every use of a verb that's imperfect will necessarily include future time or even present time. The context will be key in defining the precise extent of the duration implied by the verb. Please, Air Church, stop pontificating for the love of Jesus. Medic, that means you're not listening to me. Because four times I said, Medic, in light of verse 12, where God says to Moses, I will be with you when you go to Pharaoh future, does it make more sense to then render the same verb in 14 as I am or I will be? So how did you assume from the context, Medic? Because you're not listening. You're pretending to listen. Can we put him on timeout for a while? Because it's too much for him. It's information overload. Right. Everyone else following me here? I don't want to make something that should take me 10 minutes to articulate into a five-hour session. 
right? Okay. What's the point? What's the point? Okay. What's the point? The point is, even if you want to say I am, the very fact that the verb ehyeh is causative, right? Future tense, meaning I will be, means that you can make a case that it shouldn't be I am. It should be I will be, especially when that's the translation of the verb in verse 12. Since someone can argue strongly, it should be rendered I will be as opposed to I am, especially when that's the only way to translate the verb in verse 12, Exodus 3.12, I will be with you. You have now destroyed any connection between what God says to Moses, Exodus 3, and what Jesus says about being there before Abraham. No, there isn't much. I don't know why the admins are slow in blocking a guy who's saying gas the Jews. Admins, what are you guys doing? Taking a break? Okay, do you guys understand now? Before I move on, and I hope I'm not boring you guys with this stuff. I really hope I'm not. I really want you to learn and go into the meat of the scripture. I want you to go into the meat of the scripture and understand. Now, notice what Jonathan just did. People quoted John 8, 58 and connect with Exodus 3, 14. So he tap danced and ran to Isaiah 43, 10. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Why would you bring up Isaiah 43, 10? In a discussion that brought up Exodus 3.14 to connect it with Jesus' words in John 8.58. I don't know why this friend of mine named Joseph is texting me on my phone when he's here listening on my YouTube channel. Joseph, why are you texting me on my phone? Why can't you put it in the comment section of my YouTube session? Okay, now, coming back to the issue. Coming back to the issue. What was the issue? Jonathan, I'm not disagreeing with your connection to Isaiah 43.10, but you're not following the argument. The argument was connecting John 8.58 with Exodus 3.14. Someone quoted John 8.58 and says, you see, that's what God said in Exodus 3.14. To then bring up Isaiah 43.10 is irrelevant in this particular context. I'm trying to show how an anti-Trinitarian will shut down your argument from Exodus 3.14. If you guys don't listen, you're not going to learn the argument and how to respond to it, and you won't be prepared. You get my point? You with me there? Now, Jonathan just said, the reason why he can't comment in my YouTube channel, he goes, because you blocked me, you goof. Now, folks, what do you think is going to happen to my friend, Joseph, not Jonathan? Did I call you Jonathan? I'm sorry. I don't mean to insult Jonathan. What do you think is going to happen to my friend Joseph for calling me a goof? You think he's not going to get blocked on my phone? He He... Texts me on my phone, distracts me, and calls me a goof. <laughs> the audacity of my brothers, sisters in Christ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to be careful because some there are some oneness heretics, some children of Satan, that take these clips of mine and say, look, look, he's manifesting. He's demonized. Look at Sam Shamoon manifesting. He's demon. See, do you see what happens when you're a Trinitarian? You got to be a oneness because if you're a Trinitarian, you manifest. <laughs> But I do do it too naturally, right? I mean, it comes too natural. It's scary, isn't it? Okay. But now, coming back to the issue. Not to confuse matters. Do you see in Exodus 3, 12 to 14, the Hebrew verb, ehyeh, means I will be, right? 
I will be. Correct? So, because Ehye is rendered I will be, do you see why the anti-Trinitarian will say that you're stretching things? Because Jesus did not claim the name of Jehovah that Jehovah used in Exodus 3. Because in Exodus 3, Jehovah used the verb Ehye, which is more accurately I will be. And it's nothing remotely similar to Jesus' use of the I am. Do you understand that objection? Right? Do you understand that objection? Now, what about the Greek version of Exodus 3.14? Exodus 3.14, the Greek version. It gets even harder. Do you know why? In John 8.58, Jesus says, Prin Abram Genestai. I'm giving you the Erasmian pronunciation of the Greek. Prin Abram Genestai. Ego Aimi. He says, Ego Aimi. I am. The Greek, however, doesn't say ego aimi. It says ego aimi haon. I am haon. And then in the second occurrence, he says haon, haon has sent me to you. So in the Greek version, they have God saying he is haon. Haon. Haon means the being, the existing one, the one who exists. Okay, so the Greek translation Exodus 3 doesn't have ego eimi, it has haon as the Greek equivalent of ehye. Everyone with me there, or did I confuse you guys? I'm going to give you the English translation of the Greek. Here you go. English translation of the Greek. Hopefully you guys will pay attention to these arguments. So in the future, you won't make the same mistakes because, see, even though you guys have been following me for a while, you made the same error regarding proof texting the deity of Christ that Christians have been committing for years, even though the anti-Trinitarians have been responding. And yet we should be at a point in our understanding that we know what their responses will be and are prepared for it. Here you go. Click on that, Exodus 3. There's the link. There's the link. Go there. This is the English translation of the Greek. English translation of the Greek. And in 14, do you notice it says, And God spoke to Moses saying, I am the being. And then the last part says, Thus shall ye say to the children of Israel, The being has sent me to you. There it is. I just posted it. So even the Greek doesn't have Jehovah saying, Ego Aimi. The Greek has Jehovah saying, Haon. Haon. Ego Aimi, Haon. I am the being. Tell them, Haon, the being has sent me to you. So now an anti Trinitarian brings all this up. He's pretty much decimated your case from John 8 58, right? He's going to say, now, what was that about John 8, 58, Exodus 3, 14? You with me there? So now you see the two objections against your two proof texts, right? Your two objections against your two proof texts. And Daniel 7, that son of man is being given dominion, power, and glory. But God by nature already possesses sovereignty. He doesn't need someone to give it to him. And then secondly, secondly, Jesus' I am statements in John 8, 58 has no connection with Exodus 3, 14. No, 16, 11. You are so off field. What does I will be have anything to do with Jesus in John 8, 58? What does I will be have anything to do with John 8, 58? 
We're talking about Exodus 3.14. Why would you think that they're saying Jesus said, I will be? It's Exodus 3.14 that you're using to connect to John 8.58, right? Right? Did you get it now? Six, I want to make sure you guys got these objections because I can't move on if I'm confusing you guys. Thank you, Tony. The verb ahia was translated into Greek as haon, the being, not as ego eimi. With me there? Medic for Christ. Lexically in Hebrew, it says ehye, meaning I will be, a causative verb. But I want to share something with you guys. Any Hebrew scholar will confirm this. Hebrew is what's known as an aspectual language, verbal aspect, meaning just because a verb may be future tense, it may not be referring to the future after all, because the tenses will be determined by their use in the context. So you can have a past tense verb that refer, refers to the future. You can have a future tense verb that refers to the present. So the Hebrew language can be tricky. The verbs have to be determined by their contextual use. You get my point? Let me repeat this again. Any Hebrew scholar will tell you. In Hebrew specifically, the tenses of verbs are not always determinative of the duration of the verb. Meaning, if it's future tense, it doesn't necessarily refer to something in the future. If it's past tense, it doesn't necessarily refer to something in the past. It may be a past tense verb referring to a present reality. And a future tense may be also referring to a present reality. The context will determine the precise Duration of the verb. Okay, you with me there? So though it's a yeah, I will be, doesn't necessarily mean it should be translated future tense because God may be saying in context, I am who I am, meaning I am all that I've said I am, right? And I am the God of Abraham. And I am the God of your fathers, and I am the God of Israel, and I am your Savior, and I am your Redeemer. He may be referring to that. I am all that I say I am. He may be saying that. Now, are you aware that Exodus 3.14 in the Greek proves my point? Because notice that the Jews who translated Ehye in Greek... Translated as ha'on. On is the present participle of I me. On is simply another way of saying I me, meaning being, am, exist, present tense. On is the present tense participle of I me. Did you know that? So the Jews who translated ehye understood ehye to be present tense. I am the being, ego I me her own, the being who exists, not will exist, not did exist, exists now. So they even understood Ehye to refer to the timeless existence of God, which is why they use the present tense participle, participle form of a me. Am I confusing you guys? Are you with me there? David, if you're trying to get my attention and tell me if I got this, are you trying to educate me? You know you're not going to get far by doing that, right? The word on is the present is the present participle of I me. I me is present tense, right? It means exist. On is the present part participle. Of I me, it's present tense, right? So what's my point? The Jews that translated Exodus three fourteen into Greek, 
didn't take Ahia as referring to the future. They understood Ahia as referring to God's present existence, more specifically that he exists, meaning timelessly. He is existence. He is the being. Irrespective of past, present, and future, he is. End of story, period. Okay, you, you, you see where I'm going with this. I'm really hoping the Holy Spirit protects me from error, right? And that I'm able to help you understand, not confuse you and misinform you. I didn't see what you said, Viking lady. I couldn't see your comments. Okay. Ha'on... The Greek rendering of Exodus 3.14 is the being. It also means the existing one. It means the one who exists. On is the present participle. Participle. Participle is a verbal adjective. Present participle of a me. It's simply another form of a me. I me. A me. You with me there? It's simply another form of I, me, a, me, and it's present tense. So what's my point? The Jews that translated Exodus 3.14 into Greek didn't take Ehye as referring to the future. They understood from the context that Ehye referred to God's present reality, meaning he exists using the participle of a, me, existing, the one existing. He exists now. Emphasizing his timeless existence, that he's eternal. Did it make sense? Before I move on. So that means just because Ehye may be future, I will be. This is where you got to really get it. The context may determine that though the verb is a causative verb, meaning I will be, the context demands it should be translated as a present tense. I am. And that's how the Jews that translated Exodus 3.14 into Greek understood it. Not future, but as a present reality. God is present. God exists. He presently exists because he is existence. He's timeless. Exactly, medic for Christ. You got it. So the Greek rendering of Exodus 3.14 shows that the Jews understood it as a present tense reality. They didn't see Ehe as being future. And the reason why they took it as a present tense reality, because God is existence. So he is. He always is. Sorry about that. Everyone with me? When you say both interpretations, well, to answer your question, Jonathan Simon, is the Jews that translated Exodus 3.14 into Greek, did they necessarily translate it correctly? Was their interpretation correct? Well, that's debatable, right? You know, you, know, you know what I'm saying, Jonathan Simon? So when you say, can both interpretations be true at the same time, it must be stated. Just because that's how the Jews translated into Greek doesn't mean they were right. They could have misinterpreted or read into that phrase their theological understanding, their assumptions and presuppositions. You see my point? Jonathan Simon? Right? Okay. With that said, 
that still tells us it's not simply a Christian spin or interpretation. <clears throat> Rendering Ehyeh as I am, because even Jews who didn't believe in Jesus rendered it as a present tense reality. You see my point, Jonathan Simon? So any Jews that tried to question the Christian translations of Exodus 3.14, <clears throat> Rendering Ehye as I am and accusing Christians of bias, if they're consistent, they're going to have to condemn the Jews of also being biased. Do you get my point? Now, the only way around that, Jonathan Simon, is if they say, well, the Greek versions that you have of the Old Testament are copies produced after the time of Christ and not written by Jews, but by Christian scribes, right? That's the only way they can get around that argument. Because if I say, hold on, even Jews who are not Christians rendered Ehyeh as a present tense, not future tense, in the Greek. They'll say, well, no, your copies are Christian copies produced after Christ. My response would be, but hold on. If Christians were <clears throat> transcribing Exodus 3.14 into Greek to agree with their bias so that the copies that we have of the Old Testament in Greek came from Christian scribes who are changing the Greek version of the Old Testament to agree with their theology, then why did the Christians render it ha'on? Why didn't they keep it as ego aimi? So that agrees more fully with Jesus' words. In other words, why would Christian scribes render Exodus 3.14 into Greek as ha'on, as opposed to simply leaving it as ego aimi, making the connection with Jesus' words even that much stronger. Because as medic for Christ got it, they weren't simply making up readings, changing readings, but they were trying to faithfully preserve the Greek version of the Old Testament produced by the Jews. One second. I'm doing good, brother. Okay. Yeah, with the text me the address, I'll be there. Go I'll be there. Okay, God bless you. God bless you. Important call I had to take. Okay, you see that, Jonathan Simon? So let me repeat because you asked good questions, and I want good questions that are focused. Okay. Good questions that are focused because I want to be used of the spirit to bless you guys. Okay. Just because the Jews translated Exodus 3.14 as ha'on, present tense, denoting God's timeless existence, that he's eternal and timeless, so he is, doesn't mean they interpreted the text correctly. After all, we don't believe the Jewish scribes that translated the Old Testament into Greek were inspired, right? However, what it does show is it's not simply a Christian bias to render Ehyeh, I will be as I am, because even Jewish scribes who are not Christians understood the future tense in the context to be referring to present reality, right? You with me there? But if they come back and say, but the Greek copies of the Old Testament are all after Christ, produced by Christian scribes, preserved by Christian scribes, so that's no proof that the Jews rendered it that way because the copies of the Greek Old Testament, Greek version Old Testament, are copies produced by Christians after Christ. Well, my response would be, well, if it was Christians who were changing the meaning, then I would expect Christians to render it as ego aimi, not as her own, in order to make the connection with Jesus' words in John 8 even stronger. Why would they translate it as ha own as opposed to ego aimi? You see what my response is? Dude, I'm in a live stream teaching right now, man. Everyone with me there?
Before I move on, I want it to sink in. So going back to the point. Here's the point. Yes, the Hebrew ehye can mean I will be. However, we even have proof from Jewish scribes that they too understood ehye not as future tense, but as referring to God's present reality, that God is a present reality, that he is existence. He is the being, the one who exists necessarily, and therefore speaks to God being eternal, timeless, and sovereign. He is what he is. And in that way, it connects to Jesus in John 8, 58, because as the brother earlier said, I think it was Daniel or Daryl, when Jesus says, before Abraham came into being, Genestai, Egoimi, he's contrasting Abraham's creation, unlike Abraham who came into being. That's what the verb implies. Genestai came into a being. I am. I've always been. So unlike Abraham, who was created, who had a point of origin, I am. I've always been, which is why I could have been there before Abraham and seen Abraham. So Jesus is highlighting Abraham's creation with his timeless existence, which perfectly goes hand in hand with the Greek rendering of Exodus 3.14, because there Haon emphasizes God's timeless existence, which is exactly what Jesus was doing in John 8.58. Unlike your father who's created, I am. Existence, timeless, always been, always will be. So we have a Mohammedan in the channel who says that the Septuagint may be ripped off from origin, Codex B, fifth column. But the moron doesn't tell you that even origin's hexapla took into consideration the Hebrew Old Testament and various versions. So he's trying to wax eloquent, sounding smarter than Muhammad. All in reality, he proves he's more illiterate than Muhammad. Right? That's what happens when you kiss a stone too much and you become brain damaged because you're stoned. Right? Because if you ask the moron, where did Origen get his work from? He didn't just translate it out of thin air. The hexapla was his monumental work in which he produced different editions of the Old Testament, New Testament in various languages, but surely he must have had an exemplar from which he was copying. But see, the moron would know this, right? Because smooching the stone made him stone like his illiterate prophet. And he says, this is my best. I don't need to be better because even this is good enough to decimate you and your prophet. Now, why don't you go find a nine-year-old playing with dolls to molest like your prophet did? Okay. Sorry, guys. That's what you do with stone smo smoochers. Smooch, smooch. Okay. Keep barking. I'm going to have to muzzle you and send you to Mecca. All right. Now, for the rest of you listening, and this clown is in Paltok, by the way. It's ironic. His name is Goober. You remember Goober like, uh, you know, oh, no, Gomer, like Gomer Pyle. Goober. <laughs> I, I, my name is Gomer. I'm a Mohammedan. Where's my stone? Smoochy, smoochy. Yeah. Now, you see how stupid this guy is? He just said, like, Christian Jesus had sex with your boys. You see, being a filthy dog imitating Muhammad, he can't quote anything that's authentic and historic, true to the historical Jesus, to show that Jesus was like his filthy prophet who slept and molested a nine-year-old playing with dolls. So we quote this filthy pig's sources, and he has to attack Jesus because this son of Satan is a dog like his prophet. Huh? You see what happens? Muzzle him, yeah. See, this is the problem with these, with these pigs. You'll quote their sources. You're not making it up. Did I lie that a 54-year-old man molested a 9-year-old girl saying it was lawful halal, right? Halal was playing with dolls, and his best is, well, your Christian Jesus had sex with your boys in biographical data, Mar Saba. And if I ask this filthy dog the date of this letter, the authenticity of this letter, not only if this letter was true, it would destroy Christianity, but it would bury his prophet further in hell 
because he honors Jesus supposedly, but this filthy dog doesn't care because he's a pig and a swine who doesn't care about Jesus because he worships Muhammad, a pedophile and woman raping bandit. Right? Could you see what he said about Jesus? These pigs don't know that God raised up Assyrians who are bold as lions who will put their prophet in the place that he belongs in the pit of hell by the grace of Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge. We don't fear them or their sword. Now, why don't you go find someone else to stab and murder like your jihadi friend in London did? Right? Filthy dog. Everyone with me there? And don't you love it? You loving it? Okay, now, before I move on to the next point, did everyone understand John 8, 58, Exodus 3, 14? Because I went really, really in-depth, and I hope I didn't torture you, bore you. I'm trying my best by the grace of God's Spirit to speak clearly and make it as simple as possible. And if I'm successful, all glory to the Holy Spirit because all imperfection and sins come from us. But you understood now why you need to listen to the other side's objections to your proof texts, right? Simply parroting the same arguments you heard from your own camp may work with other Christians who believe like you, but will not work when you're dealing with anti-Trinitarians who are training themselves to demolish our arguments for the Trinity and the deity of Christ. You with me there? Is that clear? Just before I move on. So if I want to prove the deity of Christ, guess what I won't do? I won't go to John 8.58 and connect it with Exodus 3.14. I won't do that. You know what I'm going to do? You want me to show you how to use John 8 now properly? And I'll talk about I and the Father are one. So I'm going to try to kill three birds with one stone. I'm going to show you what not to say and what to say and how to say it to give the best possible defense for what you believe from scriptures by the grace of God's spirit. Okay, now let me show you how to use John 8. Are you ready for me to show you how to use John 8? Where I, before Abraham was born, I am. You ready? Okay. You don't start at John 8, 58. We go to John 8, 39 to 40. Please let me know if you are being blessed. And if you're being tortured and think I'm being on Christ, like let me know because I do have enough people who criticize me for I'm very harsh and mean and I can be very rude. And I know it, but there's a time and place to put dogs in their place and muzzle them for their filthy blasphemy. Okay. John 8, 39 to 40. Let's read it together. Here's how you use this argument. John 8, 39 to 40. And for you Assyrians, now you see why Jesus raised up an Assyrian from the tribe of Jilu. Assyrians will get this. Others who are not Assyrian won't get it. I belong to a particular tribe of the Assyrian people called Jiluaya. So I'm a Jilu, Jilue. And we're known to be hot-blooded, right? And that we can lose our temper at the drop of a hat. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? Of all the Christians he could raise from Assyrians, he raised a hot-blooded, bald, overweight Jilu who's already upset at life because he's bald and he's fat and he's not good-looking. <laughs> I like what Joel Glenn Davis just said. Wow, you don't fit your stereotype at all. No, not at all. Right? Showing you that stereotypes are lies. Okay, John 8, 39 to 40. Yep. Jesus does have a sense of who needs? What are you making? Making beauties. <laughs> All right. John 8, 39 to 40. Let me show you how to use John 8 to prove the deity of Christ, and you'll be blown away if you listen attentively. Read. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Now notice what Jesus is going to say to them. Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. If you're really Abraham's children, 
then you're going to act like Abraham and behave like Abraham and believe like Abraham. Physically, you may be his sons, but you don't truly belong to him. So one thing I want to emphasize, and if I get time to get around to it, true lineage in the eyes of God, true lineage in the eyes of God is spiritual. It's your spiritual ancestry lineage that matters to God more than your physical lineage. And that's in the Bible. Okay. But I'll get to that later and I'll show you that later because I'm going to show you where God says to physical ethnic Jews who rejected him, physical Jews who rejected him, he likens them to Cain who murdered Abel and calls Cain their ancestor, even though Cain's line was destroyed in the flood and Cain had no physical lineage beyond the flood. But he says that they belong to Cain, who was really their father, than Abraham. And yet Cain's lineage, his physical lineage, was destroyed in the flood. How could they be connected to Cain? Because he's talking about spiritual lineage. Cain is the first son of Satan, and all who belong to Satan are truly the descendants of Cain, not of Abraham. Did you know that? You want me there? So now what is he saying to the Jews in John 8, 39 and 40? If Abraham was really your father, if Abraham was really your father, you would act like Abraham. But then in John 8, 40, he proves to them they don't truly belong to Abraham. Because in John 8, verse 40, notice what it says. Notice what it says. Oops, I got to put my, hold on, man, my battery's dying. Oh, darn it. I got to put the charger on. Okay. But now you seek to kill me. Pay attention, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard from of God. This did not Abraham. Here's the proof you don't belong to Abraham. Excuse me. Here's the proof you have nothing to do with Abraham. You're trying to kill me. A man who's told you the truth that he's heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. Now, if you've been following me for more than a year, you should know the answer to this because we have discussed this plenty of times over the years. Notice the proof that they don't belong to Abraham. You're trying to kill me, something Abraham didn't do. Abraham didn't try to do what? As I put in the charger. Answer that for me. Abraham didn't try to do what? Sorry, guys. I'm trying to put in the charger. Abraham didn't try to do what? You got it. Abraham did not try to kill Jesus. But hold on. I'm getting confused here. Abraham had been dead. Abraham had been dead for 2,000 years when Jesus said this. What do you mean Abraham didn't try to kill you unlike us? Then he explains himself in John 8, 56 to 59. That's the context of 58. But most begin at 58, but ignore the context. And because you ignore the context, you don't get the meat of it. John 8, 56 to 59. Much more from Caleb. Protestants post things, so let him post. Please, brother. Okay, watch here. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. You see the difference? You're trying to kill me. When Abraham saw me, he was glad. He was excited. But you're trying to kill me. You see different reactions. Abraham's reaction to seeing me, he was glad. Your reaction at seeing me, you want to kill me. Now they ask a natural question. They ask a natural question. Our father Abraham has been dead for 2,000 years, and yet you, you don't even look 50. Notice in 57. Then said the Jews unto, unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? You've seen Abraham? You're not even 50. You've seen Abraham? Notice Jesus doesn't correct them. He doesn't say, guys, don't be stupid. I didn't see him. And I'm not saying he saw me face to face. I mean that God revealed to him my coming, which is true. God did reveal to Abraham the coming Messiah. So guys, why are you misunderstanding me? Here's what I meant. God revealed to Abraham my coming. No, that's not what he says. He doesn't say that. Notice how he answers the question. You're not yet 50 years old, yet you've seen Abraham? That's where 58 comes in. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham came into being, I am. Yes, I did see him because unlike your father, Abraham was created, I am. I've always been there and will always be there. That's the meaning. You got it now? Do you see if you stay in the context how powerful Jesus' words are without running to Exodus 3.14? He's saying, you don't belong to Abraham because you're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't try to kill me. In fact, when Abraham saw me, he was glad. You're not even 50 years old. Abraham's been dead for 2,000 years. How in the world could you have seen Abraham? Don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50, folks, because unlike your father, Abraham, who came into being, was created, I am timeless, always been, always will be. So why would I need to go to Exodus 3.14? Can you explain that to me? Why would I need to go to Exodus 3.14? The context is sufficient in of itself to show Jesus claimed to be the God that appeared to Abraham, the God who spoke to Abraham face to face, the God that Abraham saw, trusted in, believed in, and loved. Right? Thranduil. The Muslims who say that all human beings pre-existed cannot explain to you how then Jesus could have seen Abraham because though they believe that human spirits were created in the loins of Adam, they don't believe there was any human spirit that manifested and saw Abraham and spoke to him directly. That's what Jesus is saying. I saw Abraham. I saw how he reacted when he saw me. I spoke to him. He spoke to me, and he was glad to see me. How could Jesus know that if he wasn't there personally consciously to behold Abraham's reaction. Exactly, Tony. Exactly, medic for Christ. Okay. You see why I don't need to go to Exodus 3.14 to show that Jesus claimed to be God in what he said in context? But notice how some of the brothers here Quoted it. They simply quoted John 8, 58. Ignored what came before and after. Al-Najam, I'm going to send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone because I have a question for you to show you why your question is stupid and dishonest. You need to stop following Ahmad Didat. Are you ready, Al-Najam? al najis To answer the question before I block you? Are you ready to answer the question, al najis Okay. And Najis, is Jesus al Messiah? Is he the Messiah? Notice he's not going to answer because I'm sending him to Mecca. Is Jesus the Messiah al Messiah? Yeah, send this guy to Mecca to smooch the black stone because he's not interested in answering because he's a coward like his prophet. Yeah. So everyone got it, right? Walking in the light, you got it too. Okay, he answered. Good. Thank God. He answered. Okay. And Najim, is Jesus Ruchin Minhu? Is he a spirit from Allah? Is he a spirit from Allah? And Najim? Hold on, he's answering. And Najim's honest now. He's answering. Is Jesus a spirit from Allah? Ruchin Minhu? Let's see if he's going to answer. Hold on. I hate when I have to break for distractions. Okay, good. Now, al Najm, can you show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am the Messiah, I am a spirit sent by Allah, I am the virgin-born son of Mary. Show me in the Quran where Isa says, I am the Messiah, in your Quran, where he says, I am a spirit sent by Allah, and where Isa in your Quran says, I am the virgin-born son of Mary. Show me Isa saying those words in your Quran, word for word. Come on, al Najis, quickly. Because your Quran is Najis. Angela, why are you hiding him? I want him to answer. 
Where does Isa in your Quran say, I am El Messiah, I am the Messiah, I am a spirit sent from Allah, I am the virgin born son of Mary. Show me where he says those words exactly in your Quran. I didn't ask you that. Show me where Jesus says, I am the Messiah in your Quran, where he says it in those exact words. Ana al Messiah, I am the Messiah. Show me where Jesus says, I am a spirit sent from God in your Quran, where he says, I am the virgin born son of Mary. And Najis, answer. Show me Jesus, Isa, saying those things in your Quran in those exact words, or I'll send you to Mecca to kiss the black stone. Allah Akbar! I am shaking in my boots from Gomer and your filthy prophet because they'll behead me. That's what scares me. Okay, send so, Najam on his way. You see, he can't answer. Send him on his way. I don't know what you mean, Sam. Don't say that. Malika Diza. I don't know if you're a Syrian or you're another Muslimah that wants a Muslim man to violate you in the name of Allah and his messenger. It's you, Angela. You're lagging. Okay. No, he's gone anyway. You're lagging, Angela. Reboot. Okay. Now, you saw how you do, do away with? You see You see how you do away with that pathetic argument? When a Mohammedan tells you, show me where Jesus says, I am God, in those exact words, you turn the table and say, if Jesus has to say something in those exact words, you just buried Muhammad further into hell, because he's already there in hell, but you're... Bearing him further into hell and proving your Quran is a lie because nowhere in your Quran does your Jesus say, I'm the Messiah, I'm the virgin born son of Mary, I'm a spirit from Allah, and I am the word of Allah. And yet, you believe all that about Jesus, though Jesus never said it in your Quran. Why? Because unless Jesus says it, you shouldn't accept it. And he didn't say it, flush your Quran down the toilet, Allahu Akbar. Zook, I guess you don't understand the argument either. Zook, Midich, Midich. Do you understand what the objection is? Jesus has to say it. But when you're stupid enough to tell me, well, the Quran says it, then you're making my case for me. That means if the Bible says it, it should be good enough. Jesus doesn't have to say it. Zook, Midich, Midich. So you're stupid enough to make my point for me, right? When you tell me, Muslim, well, the Quran says it. Jesus doesn't say it. Well, the Bible says he's God, but that's not good enough for you. So you're a liar like your prophet and the father of all lies, Allah. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Right? You get my point? Zuk Midic Midic? I know you're not a Muslim. Zuk Midic Midic. With a name like that, there's no way you could be Muslim. I don't know any Muslim who would call himself Zuk Midich Midich. Say that five times fast. So you see my point? If someone is stupid enough, if a Muslim is stupid enough to say, well, the Quran says it, brother. I'll do it like Zakir Naik does it. Yeah, in chapter 4, with 171, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Adwadiyan, he said to me that Aitha alayhi salam, the kalimat alu, and al kalha, and ruh in the Right? That's not Zechariah Naik for you. His lisp is so bad, he makes mine look like nothing in comparison. Because I have a lisp too. But when the, the, the brother, the brother made a good one, the sister, she said to me, in the other one, with the one, the uh, sister, have you read the other one, with the other one? It's a Jesus, Galim, I don't know. Right? <laughs> Are we having fun today or what? Are we having fun today or what? Right? We're learning and having fun, aren't we? I'm going to do Halal Hogan meets Zachar Nayak. Hey, brother, Zachar man. How you doing, man? Oh, brother Halal Hogan. You know, it's, it's Haram, brother. When you go down with, with your muscles and get out, and then you bring, you know what the other one said? And the class, brother, man. I know you're a fellow Mohammedan, man, but man, you are stone, brother, because I can't understand a word you're saying, man. I am. Okay.
Okay, then. Well, no, tis da. That's not necessarily Jesus. It may be God the Father, but we'll get to that. All right. Did everyone see how to use John chapter 8? Right. How to use it properly. Well, I haven't been in the gym for a while, but pray I'm losing weight and I'm getting my shit. Oh, brother, look at that, man. And I haven't even been in the gym. Now imagine when I get into the gym, brother. You're going to see muscle upon muscle, brother. I'm single and we mingle, Zachar Nayak. What you going to do, Zachar? Brother, you get into enemy. And I don't know because in chapter 4, verse 21, if that's me, the winner is All right, man. I'm getting a little too excited right now. Can we get back to the point now? What objection, Andrew? You got to give me a specific objection. We'll answer it. Okay, now let's deal with John ten thirty. The other who needs who needs what do you mark? You're making beauties. <laughs> All right. Okay, now let's get back to the other passage that you use. See what I'm doing here, and I hope you were blessed by it nonetheless. I'm showing you how the anti-Trinitarians are prepared to respond to your proof text and showing you how to then decimate their responses. Are you seeing it? Amen. I am filled with the Holy Spirit, the joy of the Spirit, for the glory of Jesus may destroy my flesh to walk in holiness for the glory of Christ. Okay, are you ready? So now are you ready? John 10.30, when you quote, I and my Father are one, this will further reinforce the point I was making earlier. And what was the point I was making earlier? Most often, Christians will take a snippet of a passage out of context and will get amen from their crowd. If I quote John 10.30 to Trinitarians, I and the Father are one, praise the Lord. Bro. Yeah, woo, yeah, come on, lift a hand, there, woo. They get excited, right? But... But when you have an anti-Trinitarian, an anti-Trinitarian, I know that was kind of nuts. <laughs> I went a little crazy there. Anti-Trinitarian who's not impressed with your arguments, who makes it his goal in life to attack the Trinity and rob Jesus of his divine glory, he's ready to show you why John 10.30 doesn't prove what you think it proves. You with me there? Now, what is he going to tell you? He's going to say, are you sure when Jesus says, I and my Father are one, it means Jesus is one with the Father in essence, so he's one God with him. You're going to say, of course, brother. I and my Father are one. He'll say, ah, oh, hold on. Let's go to John 17, verse 11. Typical Jehovah Witness tactic, typical Unitarian argument. But if you're not evangelizing folks, if you're not interacting with other groups, if you're not listening to their <clears throat> sessions, then you're not prepared for their objections and you will be less prepared to refute them and they'll catch you off guard. I don't want you to be caught off guard. I want you to be the best you can be, all of us, including me, by the power of the Spirit, for the glory of Jesus, making the most powerful apologetic for the glory of Jesus so that we can destroy every argument and take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. John 17, 11 is their response to you. John 17, 11 is their response to you. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Oh, got you. They may be one as we are. So wait, if I am the Father one means Jesus is God, then the disciples are one as the Father and Son are one. That means the disciples are also God because they're one with them. Man, we got you, Trinitarian. We got you. You got it? We got you, Trinitarian. Sucker! So that means now all the disciples are God because they're one with God. That's what they quote, right? Now let's look at 20 to 23. 20 to 23. Yep, walking in the light, they use that as well. I'll get to that. We'll answer that. The dot is manure in the afterlife, daily gripe. John 17, 20 to 23, read with me. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, 
as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Bam, got you, sucker. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You got it? Right there. Disciples are one with God. Therefore, they must be God. So there are 15 members of the Godhead. That's their response. Now, are you ready to decimate their response? Are you ready to decimate their response? Same Greek word, hen, one. Are you ready to decimate their response? You ready with me? Andrew, they can say what they want. They have to prove their assertion and their distortion from the sound exegesis of the original languages of Scripture. Good luck in them trying to do that, Andrew Owen. Okay, now, number one, you have to be a careful reader. None of those passages say the disciples are one with God or Christ. It's not what it said. It says, may they be one with one another as you and I are one. He didn't say... May they be one with you. No, may they be one, the disciples perfectly united, as you and I are perfectly united. So number one, you're letting them get away with the misreading of the passages. The No passage said they are one with God. It says they are one in him, meaning because of God, God causes them to become one with each other. But where did it say they are one with God? Where did it say that? So you're allowing them to misread the passage, misquote the passage, and turn it against you. So number one, none of them stated, no verse stated, the disciples are one with you, God. It says, may they be one in you, meaning you will be the cause of making them one, of getting along with one another, of being like-minded, of loving each other, forming one body, you are the cause of that. In you means, in relationship to God, God will cause them to become one with one another. So where did it say, the disciples are one with God? Did it say that? That's the first response. Did it say that? Okay. The second thing, it's ironic they would quote these passages, because these passages prove... Jesus has to be God because let's read, let's reread John 17, 21 to 23. Let's see what they conveniently overlook. John 17, 21 to 23. Let's see what they conveniently overlooked. That they all may be one. Notice, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Pay attention now. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me. You guys catch it? Jesus said, I'm in all the disciples. The disciples are on, all in me. And because I'm in you, I'm connecting them to you. You're in me, Father. I'm in you, and I'm in them. And because I'm in them, they're in me and connected to you because of me. This passage argues for Jesus being omnipresent. And the reason why they're connected to the Father. Why then would an anti-Trinitarian quote a passage that shows that Jesus is omnipresent deity because he's in union with all believers in fellowship and communion with all believers and he's the reason why all believers are connected to God because he's in them connecting them to God because of this special union with God. Did you catch it? How, how does this refute the deity of Christ? You ever, does everyone understand my point? Or is someone confused? I in them, you in me, I in you, they are in us. I in them, I in you, you in me, they're in us. How can a creature say... He's in all believers, 
the world over at the same time, to the same extent, and he's the reason why they're connected to the Father. Did everyone get it or no? Before I move on. Before I move on, is it sinking in? Don't let the Mohammedans distract you. They're coming by Satan to distract you. Let them just listen. Now, here's something even more beautiful that should move you to tears. Let's read 23 one more time. John 17, 23, one more time. Watch here. I don't know if it's sunk in. I pray by the Spirit it moves every one of us. Listen to the words of Jesus. I and them, he must be omni, omnipresent for us to, for him to be in fellowship with all of us. Thou and me, that they may be, be may, that they may be made perfect in one. Now watch what he says here. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. That right there should humble you. Jesus says, because of me being in you, the Father loves you just as much as he loves me. He doesn't love you less than me. He loves you just as much as he loves me because I'm in you. Did it sink in? That the world may know, Father, you sent me and you love them as you love me. Why does the Father love me just as much as he loves Jesus? Because Jesus lives in me. I belong to Jesus. Jesus is one with me by the Spirit. And because of Jesus, the Father loves me just as much as the Son because he sees I am clothed with the Son, covered by the blood of the Son. How can he love me less? There is no divinity in any creation. It's Jesus that makes you lovable. Don't get Hindu on me, Marcus, please. Tony, you're letting Hussein distract you. Can you muzzle Hussein? Did it sink in? Did it sink in? Why are you timing out Andrew Martin? What did Andrew Martin do? Can you un... Yeah. Protestant, you timed out the wrong guy, Andrew Martin. Okay. okay, now one more time. You see how much the Godhead loves us because of Jesus. Pay attention to what Jesus said. That the world may know, Father, that you sent me and you love them as you love me. Lord, why does the Father love me just as much as he loves you? Because of me living in your hearts. Because of me covering you by my blood. Because of me being in union with you. When he sees you, he sees me because you're clothed with me. And how can he love you less than he loves me? Did it sink in? So do you see how John 17 in context backfires against the anti-Trinitarian? It shows that Jesus is omnipresent. He's in all of us. I in all of them, Father. And because you're in me and I am in them, I'm the connection between you and them. I'm connecting you, Father, with them because I happen to be in union with you, in union with them. And because I'm in them, you love them just as much as you love me because you see me in them. And you're going to use this verse to prove the opposite? A verse that shouts, Jesus is God Almighty, and it's because of Jesus the Father loves and adores us with an infinite love, loves us just as much as Jesus because he sees Jesus in us. Right? Clear, right? So that's their response to John 10.30. That's the counter response to John 10.30. Use John 17 to decimate them. 
to bury them, to destroy their blasphemy against the Trinity, against the deity of Christ. However, for the rest of you, let me show you how to use John 10, 30 in context, exactly walking in the light. That's the meaning of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Because of Christ, our mediator, God loves us with an everlasting love and sees Jesus in us, which is why he cannot love us less than the Son, because he sees the Son in us. But are you not ready to use John 10, 30 properly? I need the prayers to have her. Are you ready to use John 10, 30 correctly and show how irrefutable John 10, 30 is in context that Jesus is claiming to be one with the Father in essence? Are you ready? So after today's session, you're going to promise me to study these arguments prayerfully, to ask the Spirit to help you to make it second nature, and use these arguments more effectively so that you're no longer stumped and caught off guard. Otherwise, I'm failing as a teacher. Right? How do you use John 10, 30 properly? You don't start at 30. You start at 27. Let's look at John 10, 27, 28. Let's break it down. I did it the other day, but I'm going to do it again. John 10, 27 to 28. Okay, if anyone repeats that Christian Prince is going to debate Muhammad Ajab tomorrow, and I'll join him if I'm going to join him, you know I'm going to block you, right? This is about the 10th million person who said that. Folks, I got it the first 99 million times. Okay, John 10, 27, 28. Read with me. John 10, 27, 28. Everyone read with me. I mentioned this the other day, a couple of sessions ago, but we are creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature. Okay. My sheep hear my voice. Yep. Okay. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now notice what Jesus just said. If you have a Bible that you mark up, highlight, underline, highlight or mark the following, underline the following. My sheep, my voice in my hand. Pay attention. My sheep, my voice in my hand. There's sheep in my hand. They hear my voice, right? You got that so far? Believers are his sheep in his hand. The sheep of his hand, under his care, who hear his voice, right? Okay. Psalm 95, Psalm 95, 6 and 7. Psalm 95, 6 and 7. Let's see if you caught it. Psalm 95, 6 to 7. Let's see if you caught it. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah, our maker. Here's the key. He is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, what? Wait, 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 wait. Jesus, you said believers are your sheep in your hand. Hear your voice. The psalmist said we are the sheep of Jehovah's hand, and it's Jehovah's voice we're supposed to hear. Did you get it? My sheep, hear my voice, my sheep in my hand. Psalm says, believers are the sheep of Jehovah's hand, and they're to hear the voice of Jehovah. Did you catch it in Psalm 95, 6 to 7? Post it again. Protestant, if you don't mind. Post it again. John 10, 27, 28 with Psalm 95, 7. Just put verse 7. And what's ironic, I mentioned this several sessions ago. Some of you were listening to it, but you forgot already. You see the problem? We need to hear this over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's Spirit. Because you forgot already. At least some of you did. Notice what Jesus says again. My sheep. Hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So notice, they're my sheep in my hand, the sheep of my hand, they hear my voice. But Psalm 95, 7, for he is our God, 
and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand, today if you will hear his voice. Sound familiar? We are Jehovah's sheep, the sheep of Jehovah's hand, in his hand, under his care. We are to his voice, hear his voice. Jesus says, they are my sheep, in my hand, under my care, and they hear my voice. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Did it sink in? How to use John 10, 30? You don't start at 30. You start at 27. Hussein will challenge you to go to Mecca and smooch the black stone like a good pagan. Okay. Now, 28. 28. Malika Diza, we say L-M-B-O, not A-O. Not laugh my aspirations off, laugh my butt off. Malika Diaz, you sound Assyrian. I don't know if you are. John 10, 28. Now read with me. Paul Abdul, I know you're upset that you don't know who your father is, but blame your mother for doing Zawaj al-Muta, that dirty Shia. Send Paul Abdul on her merry way. John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now pay attention to John 10, 28. Post it one more time. One more time. John 10, 28. There's someone here named Paul Abdul. Okay. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Pay attention to the word, pluck them out of my hand. No one plucks them out of my hand. I give to them eternal life. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Let's see if you guys are making the connections. Malika Diaz, for the last time, your name sounds Assyrian. You told me you're a Christian. <clears throat> but if you have to repeat yourself, that means you're doubting your Christianity. You're trying to convince me and others. Be assured of who you are. Face the East and repent. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Morning, Mark. Read with me. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I am he. There is no God with me. Pay attention. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Wow. Wait, 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 wait. Jehovah said, I make alive and no one can deliver out of my hand. Jesus said in John 10, 28, not only do I give life, I give everlasting life and no one can pluck out of my hand. What? Wait, Jesus. Jehovah said, this is what makes him God. He alone is God, which is why he alone can give life and no one can deliver out of his hand. Who do you think you are by saying you give everlasting life and no one can pluck out of your hand? How are you speaking like this when this is the language of Jehovah? Why are you speaking like this, Jesus? Did it sink in or no? Everyone who's listening attentively, did it, is it sinking in or no? Jehovah says, here's the proof that I alone am God. Here's the proof that I alone am God. I make alive, none can deliver out of my hand. Jesus says, hey, hey, David, I know that's what they did to your mother because she was a prostitute for the Shia. She was one of the best muta horse in Iran. But that's okay. Jesus forgive you, and hopefully you won't hate your mother for giving a birth to a dog like you, in Jesus' name. For those of you wondering why I'm insulting this filthy dog and his mother, he just used the F word against John, the apostle of Christ. So if you're going to insult my Lord and his apostles, I'm going to remind you of where your mother came from. And if you want to say I'm not a Christian, I don't give a damn. You insult my Jesus and his holy servants, I'm going to insult your mother for giving birth to a filthy dog like you because that makes her a female dog. All right. Are me there? Okay. I don't take insults to Jesus Christ or his followers lightly. Maybe some Americans do. Because, brother, we just got to be loving. We just got to be like Jesus. Just turn the other cheek. Just be loving, Sam. You can follow that brand of Christianity. You insult the Lord Jesus and you insult his apostles, you're going to have to take me out.
Not saying I'm going to physically hit you. I'm not saying that. If I have to defend myself, I will. But I will give you a taste of your own medicine. I'm going to remind you of who your mother is and where you came from. Okay? So keep insulting my Lord and keep insulting his followers like this filthy dog, Gomer. I don't mean to insult filthy dogs, Gomer. They're cleaner than you and your prophet. Okay? Okay, but you're not being Christ-like, Sam. I don't see Jesus in you. Home by Amalong. All right. With me there? Okay. Folks, to make the connection, 1611 on your way to heaven. Did you guys make the connection? Did you make the connection? Jehovah says, here's the proof that I alone am God. Guys, pay attention. I give life, none can deliver out of my hand. Jesus comes and says, I give everlasting life, no one can pluck out of my hand. Is it clear as day, for those of you listening, in spite of the satanic distractions, as the blood of Jesus covers us, is it clear as day that Jesus took the words of the Old Testament, describing Jehovah and applied it to himself? Psalm 95 says, we are the sheep of Jehovah's hand, we are to hear his voice. Jesus says, you are my sheep, you hear my voice. Jehovah says, I make a life, none can deliver out of my hand. Jesus says, I give everlasting life, no one can pluck out of my hand. Is it clear as day that if you read the context of John 10, 30, not start at 30, I and my father one, but at 27, Jesus has just claimed to be God in the flesh by claiming the things the Old Testament attributes to God alone. Right? Do you know why Deuteronomy 32, 39 is even more special? Do you know why it's even more special? Why are you, why are you letting Hussein keep barking, man? Can he send this guy to Bart Ehrman, his lover? You know what makes Deuteronomy 32, 39 more special? The Greek version translates the Hebrew anihu. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 32, 39 one more time. Where he says, see now, I, even I myself am he, I am he is Anihu. You know how the Greek translated Anihu? Ego aimi. <whistles> That's the passage you use to connect with Jesus' I am statements. In Deuteronomy 32, 39, the Greek renders Anihu, the Hebrew I am he, as Ego aimi. So the Greek has God saying, see now, Ego aimi. I am. That's the passage you use to connect with Jesus' I am statements, along with Isaiah 43.10, which another brother mentioned. Here, the Greek renders Jehovah's words, anihu, I am he, as ego ami. And we know it connects with Jesus because there Jehovah says that as the I am, I give life, none can deliver out of my hand, which is exactly what Jesus says that I am claims to be able to do. Give everlasting life and no power can pluck his sheep from his hand because he's almighty. Thank you, scammers. Malika, don't start debates about denomination. I'm going to send you back to mommy. Leave it alone. Why are you asking him why they're Catholic? Why are you Malika? You want me there? No, that's not a good one, Sam Samael King. I know you're trying hard, but don't try too hard. Everyone with me there? Did you get it before I move on? Deuteronomy 32, 39 is an I am statement of Jehovah. Okay? Is an I am statement of Jehovah, and it ties in with Jesus. But in John 10, 28, let me repeat, because I'm almost done with John 10, and we're going to do a session, God willing, tomorrow. If God wills, if he gives me the health and the holiness to delight his heart. Okay? Samuel King, don't ask me why, because the ego I me is in response to a question about his identity. It's like you saying, are you Sam Shimon? I say ego I me. Ego I me is not an unqualified statement. It's an answer to your question of whether I'm that individual. So when they say, are you the Christ, the son of God? I am. What do you want it to say? Not ego I me? This is a pathetic argument. Don't use it. Trust me. Okay? Now, what was that Greek word, Grace? Okay. Rise, Lionheart. It's ego, I, me. E-G-O, E-I-M-I. Two words. Ego, 
Ego, E-G-O, and then the other word is E-I-M-I. -I, ego, I-M-E. Okay? Now, okay, now coming back to the issue, I know people say in Mark 14, 62, where he says, I am, ego, me, that's an I am. No. In Mark 15, 62, Jesus says, ego, I me, when the priest says, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? He says, I am. What do you want him to say? Not ego, I me? Of course he's going to say, ego, I me, I am. But that is in reference to the question, are you this person? Right? So that's not an ego, I me statement that you'll use to connect Jesus with Jehovah's ego, I me statements in the Greek version of the Old Testament. Don't do it. Don't waste your time. Make the best case possible for the glory of Christ, not the weakest case, so that anti-Trinitarians decimate your objections and laugh at you. Paul says we want to demolish every argument and take captive every thought, making obedient to Christ. Paul is using the language of, of brute strength and force. Demolish every argument. Obliterate it, decimate it for the glory of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6, he says, we demolish arguments. He's using the language of spiritual warfare that we're on the assault, on the offensive, and we wipe out everything in our way. We decimate everything in our way. We take captive everyone for Jesus. Well, you're not decimating objections by using pathetic arguments. Right? Yeah, the Greek version, Andrew Owen. And if you want that reference, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6, and Protestant is posting it, you see? Notice what verse 4 says. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You catch it? That's the language of warfare, spiritual warfare. He says, we don't use physical weapons. We use spiritual weapons to demolish. We're on the offensive. We're not defensive. We're offensive. We are attacking the kingdom of darkness and taking the citizens of the kingdom of darkness captive and bringing them over to Jesus. You catch it? Demolishing, casting down, obliterating anything in our way to take that heart captive for Jesus. But folks, you won't be able to demolish strongholds with weak, Pathetic arguments. You want me there? You won't be able to do it. You got to be your best at your spiritual peak, prayed up, filled with the Spirit. Fasting, and I need to do a lot more because I'm a hypocrite. Lord, save me from my hypocrisy. More praying, more fasting, more studying, more reading, more evangelizing, evangelizing more, interacting, not being afraid. You are a warrior. You're called to battle. You got to take captive the city. You got to bring down the walls of Jericho. You got to destroy all obstacles and take the city captive and every heart and slave it to Jesus. It's warfare language. It's not my language. You just read it. Paul says, demolish, cast down, take captive, ob obliterate, decimate. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. And the weapons you have is prayer, fasting, worshiping, singing to the Lord, studying the word, meditating on the word, <clears throat> living it out, evangelizing doing apologetics, being involved with Christians, praying with Christians, worshiping. With, that's your spiritual weapons, your spiritual warfare. Right? The apostles and Jesus were not effeminate, wishy-washy Christians. They, I, look, if you guys think I'm lying, can you explain to me, every one of you, why is it wherever Paul went, riots started? Wherever Paul went, an argument broke out, fighting broke out, riots started, and at times it landed him in prison, and at times he got stoned. Do you think Paul was preaching like some of these preachers today? Jesus loves you, brother. 
I just don't know. You know, this is all get. Do you think that kind of Christianity gets that kind of reaction? No, honestly, what type of Christianity gets crowds riled up to want to bum rush you, beat you, imprison prison you, and stone you, and kill you? Not this. Jesus loves you. I really don't know. You know, the Bible can mean this. The Bible means this. But it may mean this too. You know. You get my point? Man, they were warriors. Jesus overturned tables. Money changers took a band, of course, started whipping animals and humans. Even though some people, well, he didn't whip humans. Yeah, I know. He just made a band of courts to whip animals. Come on, man. Be serious. Right? Be serious. I don't mean to go on a rant. What I'm trying to say is we need more people bold and zealous for Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. I need to be tempered more with love and patience. That is my weakness and patience. But some of you need to be more bold and less mild. So when someone insults Jesus and blasphemes him, you don't just sit there and ignore him or say, Jesus loves you. No, your mother. If your mother wasn't garbage, she wouldn't give birth to a dog like you, you filthy dog. Right? Everyone there? I just hope it's sinking in. I want you guys to be the best for Jesus. Not for me. I'm nothing. I'm a hypocrite. This weekend, I failed Jesus. I succumbed to my fleshly desires, warring with my flesh, and asking Jesus, please don't condemn me. Please forgive me. Please help me. Please heal me. Save me, Lord. I am sick, and I need you. And I want to be a doer of your word. I don't want to anger you. I don't want to grieve your spirit. Right? And no one's saying insult people, Malika. You do not insult. And if you notice, I don't start the insults. I finish them. Right? I don't just come out insulting people because that's not the way we evangelize. We are to be gracious and loving. But when the insults come, put that dog in his place. Okay. Now, with that said, John 10, 28, let's finish it. We all do lion art. Pray for me and ask the Lord to have mercy on all of us. John 10, 28. My many? Hmm, I don't know it's my many. John 10, 28. Now let's break this down again. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Guys, question, question. Jesus says he gives all the sheep eternal life. Let me explain what eternal life means. Moral incorruptible, in, incorruptibility, where Jesus will make you morally incorruptible, where you cannot ever sin again, and he's going to give you a physical body that's indestructible. And he's going to do this for all believers that belong to him. So here's my question to every one of you. What kind of attributes is Jesus claiming to have to be able to change the sheep, eventually he will, change them to become morally incorruptible where it will be impossible for them to sin and give them physical bodies that are indestructible, where they live forever, pain-free, disease-free, death-free. That's what he just claimed that he will do for all the sheep and guaranteeing their everlasting preservation where they will never perish, they'll never be destroyed, guaranteeing that. What kind of power, what kind of attributes must Jesus possess to make that claim? Omnipotent, right? A good, all power. But what else? He must be omniscient. Why omniscient? Because he must know who the sheep are. How many are the sheep? Who the sheep are? He must know them. And he has to have the ability to preserve them that no power can stop him from preserving them immortal, indestructible. And you're telling me Jesus didn't claim to be God. Is that what you're telling me? Jesus didn't claim to be God. Are you serious? A finite temporal creature can say what Jesus said in John 10, 27, 28. My sheep in my hand, in my care, hear my voice. No one can destroy them because I guarantee their everlasting preservation. No power can stop me from preserving them from ever. 
And that sounds like Jesus is claiming to be something other than God. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Now notice what he says. John 10, 29. John 10, 29. Now notice what he says. John 10, 29. Right after 28. My father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Jesus says no one can pluck them out of my hand. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. And that's where John 10, 30 comes in. That's when he says John 10, 30. Now let's read John 10, 30. Now let's read John 10, 30. I and my father are one. Do you now see the context of that statement? Why do you start at 30 and ignore 27, 29? I and my father are one in our ability to preserve all believers forever indestructible. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. No one can pluck them out of my hand because I and my father are one. That's the context. Why start at verse 30? But then it gets more amazing. Oh, yeah, see? Someone already knew it, but it gets better. You guys know my lines. Okay, but hold on. If you actually look at the Greek for R, that verb R, it's, and those Greek speakers can confirm, it's the Greek verb esmen. Esmen. Esmen literally is we are. We are. Here you go. Ego ke ha pater hen esmen. Here it is. The verb are in Greek is esmen. You know what esmen is? We are. Esmen is E S M E N. We are one, proving they're not the same person. They're two. We. Him and I make up we. We are one. So we're not one person. That's why he uses the plural verb we. But they have the same power. So here Jesus confirms there are two different persons, both possessing the same infinite power of God, which means both of them must exist as the one God. That's all in John 10, 27 to 30, if you start at 27 and not step at 30. You with me there? Do you see how now to properly use John 10, 30? Jesus says, I give them everlasting, morally incorruptible, physically indestructible life to all my sheep. Impossible if he's a creature. No one can deliver them out of my hand, meaning no one will destroy them. No one will make me fail in preserving them perfectly forever. They're my sheep in my hand, hear my voice. All of which Jehovah says and is said about Jehovah in the Old Testament. And then he says, similarly, no one can pluck them out of my father's hand like no one can pluck them out of my hand. You know why? I and my father, we, both of us are one in our power and ability to preserve all believers forever. Now you'll understand why the Jews reacted the way they did in John 10, 31 to 33. Lord willing, I'm going to do have to do a part two tomorrow on John 10, 34, 36, because that's another objection, but I don't have time to address it right now. Yeah, this dumb, it's, it's, there's a dummy, another Mohammedan, another dog of Muhammad. He says, "My, I'm doctor, my father's doctor, I'm my father one. He's quoting Zachariah, but let me show you how stupid you are. God is not human. Unless your father's a dog, if you and your father are one, you just said that you are human like your father is, and you have the same ability that your father does. So that means you're stupider than Zachariah and your prophet. Yes, you are one with your father in essence, because your father is human, you're human, you're not the same person, and both of you have the ability to perform the work of a doctor. So because you're stupid and paired Zachariah, you didn't just see how you just proved my point, moron. John 10, 31 to 33. Let's finish it. Now you'll see why the Jews reacted the way they did. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Then the Jews took up stones to stone him again. 
Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? Now notice their response. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Why? Because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Why did they say that? Because these Jews knew the Old Testament. Guys, let me unpack it. Please pay attention. Let it sink in by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Jews knew the Old Testament. They knew what Jesus just said, only God could say. They knew that according to Psalm 95, believers are the sheep of Jehovah's hand. And they hear the voice of Jehovah. But they just heard Jesus, a Jewish man, a man saying, they're my sheep, in my hand they hear my voice. That's number one. They also know from the Old Testament, Jehovah alone gives life and no one can deliver out of his, out of his hand. They just heard Jesus say, I give everlasting life, no one can deliver out of my hand. And they also realized that Jesus claimed that the Father is someone else. He's not the Father. So now notice why the Jews are angry. They see a man, a flesh and blood man, who just said he's not the father, and they know the father is God, but then claim to be God because he claims the very language with the Old Testament attributes to Jehovah alone. So now their world is turned upside down. They're livid. You're not the father, and yet you are a man, but you claim to be the God of the Old Testament, even though God is not a man, you're blaspheming. You got it? You see what, why they thought he was blaspheming? You're a man. You're not the father. But you just claim what only Jehovah God can do. So you're claiming things that only God can do. But you're just a man and you're not the father. So you're claiming to be God even though you're not the father. Even though you're just a man. You are blaspheming. So they're right. He is a man. They're right. He did claim to be God. They're right. He is not the father, but they're wrong. He wasn't blaspheming. You get it? So the Jews correctly understood. This man is not the father, but he claims to be Jehovah God. They were correct. He did claim to be God because he claimed the things the Old Testament says of God and only God. And he is a man. And he's not the father, but where they were wrong in assuming he's blaspheming because now they're being introduced to the fact that the one God of Israel is more than one person, something they shouldn't have a problem with because the Old Testament testifies to it. And one of those persons who's not the father now stood before them as a flesh and blood Jew named Jesus. Right? Lord willing, I'm going to do part two tomorrow. Because I have to deal with John 10, 34 to 36, where Jesus, say, is it, where Jesus said, is it not written in your law, you are God's? Because that's also used by anti-Trinitarians to refute all of this evidence. So Lord Jesus willing, pray for my health, my purity, my holiness, and my daughters. And for favor tomorrow, I got a meeting. Pray it's favorable. God turns that person's heart favorably towards me for the sake of Jesus so I can stay here. And afterwards, I'll do John 10, 34, 36. So God willing, hold me accountable. I have to explain what John 10, 34, 36 means and does it mean because that's often quoted against us. But so far, did you guys understand two things? Number one, <clears throat> it's not enough to quote passages that you think prove the deity of Christ without listening to how our enemies, our opponents, respond to those passages. That's number one. You got to hear how they deal with our arguments. Number two, you also learn it's not enough to simply take a snippet of a verse and not see what that verse means in the context. Why do you quote John 8, 58 and ignore 56 to 59? Why do you quote John 10, 30 and ignore verses 27 to 33? Why do you quote a snippet of a statement from Jesus and ignore the context in which he uttered those words. Right? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah, God Almighty in the flesh, to the glory of God the Father. Lord Jesus, please love us as only you can love us. Love my daughters, Lord. Please fight for us. And Lord Jesus, save us from our sinfulness. Please forgive me and help me. Help us to die to our flesh, to walk in the life of the Spirit. Lord Jesus, give me miraculous favor with the powers that be. Fight for me, Lord, and my daughters. 
and heal me of my loneliness. Provide for them and bring them to me and bless your people, Lord Jesus. All who are listening, bless their loved ones and save us for your glory until you come or until you call us home. We need you, Lord Jesus. Please, Lord, please be patient with us and please forgive me for failing you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We honestly want to love you as perfectly as possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of your spirit, we are in love with you, though we fail you, Lord. I fail you, Lord. Please, Lord Jesus, please, Khori, Khayi, Khubbi, Alahi, my love, my God, my life, our love, our God, our life, our friend. You understand our weakness. Please have mercy on us. You are the Father's beloved. His heart become flesh. Love us, love our families, love my daughters as only you can. We love you, Lord Jesus. Our brother, our friend, our all in all, in Jesus' name. Lord willing, see you tomorrow. Keep praying for favor and miracle.